If you're an athlete, you know the greatest motivator of all is the fear of letting your teammates down. After all, a team is only as good as its weakest link. So you owe it to those wearing the same jersey as you to be your best every time you step on the field. That's why there's no vape in team. When you vape, you can expose your lungs to toxic chemicals that can damage your lungs. If you're a step behind, the team's a step behind. Brought to you by The Real Cost and the FDA. ACAST powers the world's best podcasts. Here's a show that we recommend. Hey, I'm Kim Holderness. And I'm Ben Holderness. We host the Holderness Family Podcast every Tuesday. You may know us from the silly videos that we make online. Or a book about marriage called Everybody Fights. Or as winners of season 33 of The Amazing Race. Still can't believe that happened. Listen, we do a lot of stuff, but our podcast is our most favorite thing. Yeah, because every week we get to sit down face-to-face, talk to each other about marriage, family, mental health, or just anything that we want to know more about. Sometimes we have expert interviews, sometimes it's just us, but our goal is to bring some joy and laughter into your life every week. Our other goal is that maybe you will learn something as well. Right. So search the Holderness Family Podcast and check out our most recent episodes. We have one about staying organized with creators of the Home Edit. And one about being diagnosed with ADHD as an adult. We hope you'll join us. Acast helps creators launch, grow, and monetize their podcasts everywhere. Acast.com. Hi, it's Dave here, and I'm not with my wife, Kathy, today. I'm with my friend Tom Silcock. Hi, Tom. Hi, he's eloped. He's with me now. <laughs> yes, uh, we live together. We're living a very comfortable life in... Uh, where do people elope to these days? Uh, I don't know. T- t- Tel Aviv? <laughs> sure. Yes, yeah, we're in... Oh, we're in... Yeah, Tel Aviv. So it is... Uh, we're here to talk about the, the, the best games of 2022. Um it's been a couple of years since we did this. The last time uh, Tom and I talked through our uh, the games we played was 2020. I had to look it up. Um, I think we skipped it last year because, well, I'd, I hadn't really played any video games in 2021. And spoiler alert, I've barely played any this year either. Um, but we did get a message um, from one of our patrons over at patreon.com forward slash the cinema. Paul Wallace. And Paul said... Um, Hi, Dave. It's that time of year where I'm wondering if you're going to do a best games that you've played in the last two years with Tom. I won't be surprised if you say no, of course, bearing in mind that you work, have a family and create awesome podcasts regularly. Just thought I'd ask as I do enjoy them. Uh, I thought I'd read that out because it's, uh, you know, he's flattering uh, us. And, uh, you know, I absolutely love that. So uh, thanks, Paul. Um, uh, there are uh, I did look at the stats a lot of people do listen to this um, but uh, only Paul seems to write write to us so uh, if you <laughs> if you if you have missed us uh, me and Tom having these chats do let us know we're at the cinemile at gmail.com or at the cinemile on all the platforms or you can message Tom directly at T Silcock on Twitter it's either, no it's T Silcock or it's Tom Silcock you'll find me you'll find a Tom Silcock it's one of those in Google one of them will show up there's not too many T. Silcox floating around, is there? Thankfully not. But no. there is another Tom Silcox who does do uh, videography and directing work who isn't me, which is also quite infuriating when huh. I'm trying to find work. Are you sure it's not you? I, so far as I know, is that where I live a double life in Cornwall? Who's to say? <laughs> um, okay, so Tom, how, how have you been? What have you been playing the last uh, two years? So I, I should yeah, say we're going to do uh, we're going to do our top fives. We're going to do some honourable mentions. Um, and then, yeah, have a bit of a chit chat about the year in uh, in gaming or the two years. So, yeah, what have, what have you been up to? Yes, what you been playing? No, I think it's it's a really interesting uh, time for games, as it always is, especially uh, sort of post COVID. Now we're still feeling the shockwaves of COVID in game production, um, which has meant that the releases are getting a little bit weird. They're a little bit wild and wonderful at the moment, um, and also kind of few and far between. I don't know about you, but there's not been many games this year which have been like oh this is the standout must play there's been maybe one or two titles but it's not the usual saturation of of the of the year release schedule that you would come to expect um so it's it's a kind of wild and wonderful list uh that i've I've put together for you david i'm I'm, i believe yours is similarly strange mine uh, mine is i will say embarrassing I'm embarrassed by this list. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> if Paul Wallace hadn't messaged us, I, I'd have been reticent to even come on and you and did say this, Paul. The, this is on say you. These top five, because I pretty much had. I said to Tom before the call. You know, he he said oh, I've got some honourable mentions. I was like, I have 
No honourable mentions, pretty much, because I played five games. I think I've got <laughs> one extra one, maybe. And so my top five is just the games I played this year. They're also... I think only one of them actually came out this year. That's how far behind I am. And 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 uh, one of them is a mobile game. So I'm, I'm really... I... <laughs> <laughs> I just, I'm just absolutely embarrassed by this. I can't, I, I can't call myself a gamer anymore. I think, like Paul said, I don't have a lot of time to, to game. I get about like one or two hours to myself a week, um, and I find that I'm, I'm more gravitating now towards um, stuff that's quick and disposable, uh, so you can play short rounds of something, right? Rather than any time I've tried to get into a big, meaty open world or narrative driven game. I just uh, I uh, I don't have enough time to to really get into it, and then I lose momentum between you know a week or two weeks pass. Um, so I'm finding that a bit of a challenge. I think when the kids are a little bit older, and when they probably start gaming, I probably I'll probably get back into it. Um, but Tom, you don't you don't have young kids, and you have disposable time and income. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that? Remember disposable time when nothing mattered? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. It's, um, I do think there has been a trend in uh, how games are being made at the moment where they seem to be gravitating towards these kind of playable in 20-minute chunk things. And I think for exactly that reason, which I'm big into because there was nothing worse than sitting down for something like uh, Hideo Kojima used to be the absolute worst for this, where it's like, oh, you're, you're going to be here for the next three hours in a singular mission that you can't skip. Uh, any cutscenes on and you will restart from the beginning if you fail so yeah that's that's no way to live who's got that kind of time i know i know the last time we talked death stranding was on your list right yes, uh, and and you you um you um talked me around to it so much because i'd been quite put off by it as a walking sim um and an amazon and i think you admitted that that's pretty much what it is and amazon delivery package the bezos simulator um, 3000 yeah, yeah yeah but you but you talked about it so much that i was i picked it up on a sale and it uh and like and i was like i'm gonna do this and i and i haven't even started it yet because i'm really intimidated <laughs> by it but i will get there one day it's sitting there if ever you find you've got a weekend aside, you might be able to break the first act. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Um, well, let's get into it. Uh, Tom, give, give us your... Uh, what's your fifth best game that you played played this year? Again, re- reiterate, guys, none of these are new. Uh, this is just, it's just a round of <laughs> things that we played, not things that were released this year or last year. Yeah, I've tried to find some tenuous ways to justify why I might put these on these lists this year. And I think the, this game had some DLC that was maybe released last year. So that counts, right? That counts. Yeah. Um, it's close enough. But uh, it is Wasteland 3. Um, I've not played any of the Wasteland games before. Uh, but if you like XCOM or any of the kind <gasps> of turn-based strategy likes, yep, uh, this is I love a XCOM. game for you. No, you'll be big into this then, Dave. Cause, um, why why have I not heard on... of Wasteland why haven't yeah, I heard it's... of the, the, the first two wastelands? <laughs> um, yes, well, uh, I, at the start of the year, picked up the Xbox Game Pass, where you can, of course, play pretty much the entire roster of every game that's come out on Xbox, more or less, um, for the low, low price of however much it is a month. And um, within that, you can also do the gaming streaming options, the cloud streaming game options, which, um, mm. given the state of the national infrastructure at the moment it just about holds up um and makes games especially ones like these turn-based ones perfectly playable um and that's opened a whole world of games up that i'd previously not i was a i was a sony kid i just gravitated towards the playstation because i like the exclusives but now um it's not only all of the xbox exclusives but some of the you know games like wasteland that are on there um have the opportunity to play and it is absolutely excellent i would recommend it so describe what what is the Wasteland um, series? What's it about? It's akin to a Fallout esque setting. Um, oh yeah, where you are playing as a series of rangers, uh, a squad who are trying to sort of put your um, put your ranger group back back together. It's very akin to you know typical an uh, underdog story uh, that you would expect from something like XCOM. Um, but yeah, very sort of squad based tactical things. But what it does and what I think is really interesting about what it mixes up in the format is there's a lot more kind of RPG elements. There's a lot of kind of open world exploration. Whereas on something like XCOM, you're kind of stuck to the ship and then you launch out to individual missions. 
This is much more about you taking your squad from place to place. And then when there's an encounter, that's it. That's when the world kind of opens up into the grid that we're all familiar with um, for the XCOM likes. And um, within that, each of your squad members has their own levels and their own abilities. And you've got a lot of customization as to how you want to build those out. Um, it's like playing an RPG, but for six characters, and bigger than that if you if you wish to make your squad larger as well. But you take six out on an outing at any one time. Um, nice. Within that as well, like each of them level in 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 their own way. Uh, you've got really strong storytelling because some of these characters that you take with you will be quite involved in the narrative that's happening, which opens dialogue options. It's just a, like a much more advanced, a much more fleshed out version of what XCOM was offering, um, and really tightly executed as well. Does it have permadeath? It does have permadeath. Permadeath, I think, is uh, the only way to play any game at the moment. That's, yeah. that's the only way I, forward. Anything squad-based, well, what... permadeath only. It's one of my favourite things about XCOM. XCOM is one of my favourite series um, of all time. And the um, you are just you get so invested in, in your squad and these characters because you're putting this time and effort into them. And when they die, you, you, you feel it. And it's frustrating. Um but it sounds like this has uh, an edge on XCOM in that uh, from uh, in that narrative standpoint, as you describe, and that and that more of a uh, sort of character RPG element, because that that was probably one of the weaker points of uh, of XCOM. You kind of had to fill in the blanks yourself as to uh, <laughs> as to there, there wasn't much of a story really. Or uh, yeah, totally. I, yeah. I think that's all stuff that they would have built on if they made an XCOM three, which I don't think is off the cards. But instead, that team went on to develop the. Marvel Midnight Suns, I believe. Which, yeah, which uh, I was expecting released. to have on my list, and I went out to buy it. Um, but I don't have a PS5, and I, it's it, the PS4 um, release has been delayed. Which is, um, is so bizarre for a game like that, where it is all about strategy, and it's it's not like a graphical yeah. powerhouse. No, if anything, the graphics look shite on it. So yeah, <laughs> just get just get it out. Well, they they have a PS4 port. They're just it's just they've delayed the release for some reason. I guess to try and get people to buy PS5s, but they that's you can't buy them. So I don't know. Yeah. Pick, pick well, a lane. It's better to do that than the mistake of um, the Cyberpunk release a uh, year before last, where it worked yeah. only on the latest gen and not the previous ones at all, really. And that is, I think that's the last time we spoke uh, on this podcast, not in, uh, spoke at all. Still made the um, list, even on the Chunky PS4. I, apparently it's been fixed now as well, so if anyone's thinking about picking up Cyberpunk, now's the time. I've got it. I probably should go back uh, soon. As soon as Once I, you finish Death Stranding, you can get right to download it. Download it. Yeah, Wander it. Wasteland, sorry. Um, very good. Well, my, my number five is... Um, is a game that I think I think I talked about two years ago, but I'd, I'm still playing it, and uh, it's still on my list. Uh, I Slay the Spire, which I'm playing on um, Nintendo Switch, but I, I think it's available on uh, Steam as well. So I'm a big sucker for um, um, turn-based combat, as as we've just talked about, um, but also uh, card games. Um, and Slay the Spire, for anyone who doesn't know, is a rogue-like. Um, um, card collecting game um where with sort of very simple and basic graphics where you, you you're trying to um ascend a a tower or a spire in, in in this in this instance um and the games last about you know 30 45 minutes um and you're you don't um customize a deck um as you go like in something like hearthstone um and and own that deck you start from scratch and then you in each of those um, sessions you build a, a deck from from scratch from from battles um and so forth but it is incredibly um uh tight and compelling uh, gameplay it's got a lot of variety it's got a lot of room for for strategy it's bloody difficult as well it's super super challenging um and it's got so much replayability i've been playing it for i think four or five years straight i would say i've put in three or four hundred hours into this thing at this stage and i still have not beaten it uh but i've got uh, but i've come close um have you have you played tom i think i talked about it a couple of years ago you have indeed yeah i remember i remember you mentioning um i've not yet um despite your uh your pleas to to make that happen i i'm curious like what is it about it that makes you keep coming back year after year Good question. I think I think it's back to that thing where it is. It's uh, it's kind of short and digestible uh, enough that I can just you know pick it up and play it and put it back down again. Um, it's uh, I, and I just love um, I love being <laughs> I don't know I, I I love 
card games and quick strategy games i think that's probably and turn-based stuff i think that's probably my uh, as you'll see in a few other bits in my list that's kind of where my uh where my heart lies um uh, they, and they actually released the Kickstarter for a board game version of it uh, this year as well, which I had to stop myself um, from buying because there's just too many pieces to it. It looked like it would take an hour just to set it up. <laughs> and, and also, it's one of those things where this works so well as a as a video game because it's doing all the calculations for you in the background, whereas you'd have to just do a lot of maths and move counters around in a board game, so it didn't quite make sense to me. Yeah, the maths element to any game it sort of removes the fun, really, isn't it? What's the what is the purpose of having that massive computer in front of you? If you don't have to do that. Yeah, no, I'm with you. But no, I absolutely see the appeal of those. I think, especially a lot of turn based stuff as well, where um, you're not having you're not at the mercy of everything that's happening. If that makes sense, where it's like, oh, I can actually stop here for a split second. I can, <laughs> can yeah. catch my breath. I can make a and have make a, a, con- a coherent thought. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's my number five. That's Slay the Spire. I played it on uh, Nintendo switch where did you play wasteland 3 oh you said uh, xbox wasn't it tom for Wa- yes wasteland 3. yes indeed yeah. it's available on on almost all things i'm not sure if there's a switch version but that would be surprise me if there wasn't because uh, it is the kind of game that would port perfectly to that i mean everything ends up on the switch eventually about two years on a later. long enough timeline <laughs> <laughs> um all right tom what's your number four game of the year Number four, um, in it, similarly, I haven't had the chance to play as many games as I would have hoped last year, and I don't know if it's fair to put this on number four because I did really enjoy it, but uh, Forza Horizon 5, which was the... Again, you really yeah. see that I lent in hard to the Xbox Game Pass. It's like, if I've got it, I'm going to play everything <laughs> on the Xbox. Um, but it's it's just really good. It's so nice to play an arcade racer um, like the like the days of old. I miss the times of burnout and you know the oh. the, the need for speeds of back in the day. Everything burnout now seems to, burnout paradise. Yeah, one of one of the best. Oh, I'll go I'll go earlier than that. I said burnout three takedown was ah uh, takedown was was very peak good arcade racer. Yeah, um, I had that on any the PSP. Game that gives me a mo- the PSP, dang, yeah, that's that's taking me back. Remember that? <laughs> um, any game that gives me a mode with the express purpose of crashing, I'm all for. Sign me up for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> which sadly, sadly, Forza doesn't. But it reminded me so much of that because it was just fun to pick up, and it wasn't such a, like a, a realistic like the other the other Forza um, racing games in the franchise. The Horizon series that they've done is much more the arcade they're much more hey this is here's a licensed car just go and tear through mexico have a great time and it is it is just genuinely fun the opening cutscene that you get or the race that you have to do where you've got planes flying over and you've got all all manner of like um you know planes and cars and boats and all these different like nonsense that you're racing it's like yeah obviously this isn't this isn't a realistic simulator but it is fun <laughs> which is something that i think <laughs> has been missing a lot in a lot of racing games recently does it have um, planes trains really and refreshing. automobiles is there is a train there is a train race yes so there are indeed Excellent. planes trains and automobiles you start most of your races falling out of a plane i'm all for that that's what i want give me this fast and the furious nonsense i was about to say that happened in one of the fast and the furious films <laughs> in one of the it's recent, like someone took it? a look at that and was just like yeah you know what that is that's pr- that's pretty cool they're just slinging in the game um, see, see this is it. news to me i i i always thought forza I've, I've never played any of the forza series but i always thought they were in the gran turismo vein where they were very um you know sort of hard hardcore sim racing it sounds like they kind of are but you said this is a sort of this is the fun sort of half half brother version of it is it yeah the, the fun yeah. uncle um the it's a, <laughs> the two strands that they've done where they've taken one which is and i think one of the most sport series has come out recently which is very much like the turismo racing sim track based stuff um, and then they've got like a much more kind of open world, explorey, nonsense location, jumping off of volcanoes kind of world, which is what they've been doing with the uh, Horizon series. I mean, the last Horizon series, I think, was set in the UK, Horizon 4. Um, and that, obviously, the UK, there's some breathtaking scenery in there. However, you know, there's no volcanoes happening in, in the UK, really. Uh, <laughs> that you know uh, the- of that i know of the biomes that we have here are kind of like maybe maybe it's just not as exciting to me because i live here (laughs) but uh certainly to take it to somewhere like mexico where you've got these stunning beaches the jungles these you know motorways that tear through all manner of different environments um it's generally very exciting and it's better than being on the m25 yeah stuck stuck in major delays (laughs) there's an incident up ahead 
Yeah, no, absolutely. If there's going to be an incident up ahead, I'd hope it's like some sort of lava spill. That's that's just it's more exciting. <laughs> that's a that too much to ask for in a game. Um, but there's it's a good a good progression system in it as well. I think like a lot of races now try and give you everything all at once, which um, I've always found quite frustrating. It's like, hey, you've been here for twelve minutes. Have a supercar. It's like, oh. I've not really earned that then. <laughs> I want to start <laughs> a beat up polo from the 90s and make my yeah. way to the top. And it, it does it does send you on that path. Love it. Okay, so that's Forza Horizon... What five. number? Five. Forza Horizon 5, five yep. on, the, uh, on the Xbox Game Pass. Um, and this ties nightly, nicely into my number four game of 2022, which was is also called Horizon. Uh, and it's Horizon Zero Dawn. I think that's the right name. It's not forbid. The other one's Forbidden West, right? The newer one, the one that actually yes, came indeed. out in twenty twenty two. So you've, yeah, you've so played I, the prequel by <laughs> some years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I didn't play. I didn't play that one, um, uh, which I think is a PS five exclusive. Um, I picked up Horizon Zero Dawn because I thought I'll catch up with this series everyone's talking about. Let's start at the beginning, see what all the fuss is about, and uh, I see what all the fuss is about. Um, it's a great. <laughs> It's a great series. What I really like, um, and, and caveat, I have only played maybe 15, 10, 10 15 hours of this um, in, in and around. I've pretty pretty much just done the, the first act, I think. Um, right. So I kind of got to the point where the world really opened out and it became huge. And then I got a bit intimidated <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's, and I was like, "Oh my god, I, this game's going to take me a hundred hours to finish." Weirdly, at that stage, that is the point of which the game only gets better. Oh, um, Dave! Yes, because yeah, the opening, the opening few hours on that can be a little, a little bit of a slog. And um, I, I certainly remember playing that at the time and thinking, "Oh god, I hope this, I hope this goes somewhere quickly." And the closing moments of that first act is where it gets really interesting. Um, exactly, and, it, and like and, you say, it's when the world starts to expand as well. And we won't spoil it, but. Um, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. I think from a, the the story really kicks into gear uh, at that point. But um, I, I was I was loving all that stuff. Uh, it, it's essentially like a ten hour tutorial in a way, um, yeah. but it gives you but well, it gives t- you a lot of room. Tell us about the world, Dave. Set up the set up yes. the universe. So I think this is this game does a really good job of uh, world building, and it looks gorgeous. Uh, so I played this on on PS4. The um, it is set in a, a futuristic planet Earth where uh, the remaining human beings um, have formed a sort of a, a sort of a primitive uh, society. Um, so it's kind of got sort of um, forager, sort of uh, early man, sort of vibes to it. But it's that it's also uh, got a, a post-apocalyptic sort of setting. So you know, there's a skyscrapers covered in uh, moss and that and that kind of vibe and the threat in this uh, massive open world are robotic animals right i forget what they're called they have a name for them but they are um you know you've got uh, sort of like metal it's it's kind of like those horrible uh, robot creatures that that uh, that that company is making um in real life you know those little dogs what's that name um What's the name of the robotics company? You know, oh, like the Boston Dynamics. Boston Dynamics. Uh, that's yeah, it. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Um, so it's like if what? What if Boston Dynamics um, just went too far, and then the the uh, robot animals took over the world? And that's and that's kind of it's 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 looking at that world maybe hundreds or thousands of years a- after the fact. Um, and what I really like about this game is it puts a lot of attention into its uh, its character. It's um, female protagonist uh who's so memorable that i can't remember her name um aloy but the, aloy, voice aloy thank Ashley you Birch. yeah um but uh uh I, I i'm being facetious she is she is a really good and memorable character a really excellent uh an interesting protagonist um the the society that she lives in and the relationships she, she has with those characters even in the 10 to 15 hours i, I played it where i was very much invested in um the world was interesting and it has a lot of twists and turns and the gameplay is uh, fun um and has a lot of the combat has good variety um and i and uh, yeah i look forward to someday going back and finishing it <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds like you got to the end tom have you played the yeah, second one as well yeah i i would say it's worth 
pressing on from the point of which you've got to because it like i say the, the as the world expands it really does start to get good there you start to come across uh, different areas where you'll be meeting new wild and ferocious mechanized uh creatures to the when you look at some of them they're like there's just no way i am going to be able to take this down and then by the end game and you've learned everything there is to learn and you've mastered those skills it feels a lot more tangible which i i really respect from a game as opposed to just giving you incremental levels of of enemy until you get to a big boss and you've not really noticed any sort of change it does make you feel like oh there's no way in hell that's even possible by the end of it it's just like okay I know what to do here. I'll need a lot of ammo, <laughs> but I know what to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree. There's all, I, I always have a lot of respect for a game that um, presents to you an unwinnable fight um, occasionally and just reminds you of the stakes. And then, as you say, uh, makes it more worthwhile when you get back there 60 hours later and yeah. are able and to, to there's so it. like So few games offer any sense of threat now where, where I think everything is just yeah. kind of like, hey, here's a fun little playground that you can go and mess around in. Whereas there are moments in that game where it's just like, oh Christ, I am in trouble. <laughs> I need to leave now. Yeah, modern games do a lot of hand-holding, don't they? Yeah, very much so. Uh, so that's my number four, Horizon Zero Dawn on PS4. So Tom, what was your number three? Number three? Um, bit of a left field choice because I've typically gravitated towards most of the kind of big triple a game releases of the last few years or certainly i used to because that used to be a a good sign off of quality it's hey it's that big game from ubisoft or whatever that means it's going to be good which now couldn't be further from the truth i take everything back (laughs) that i said uh big empty worlds with nothing in them Uh, this is a tiny tiny game called sleeper citizen it is a text-based dice-based um, really tightly story told game. I've seen Dave's eyes light up at the word dice space. I love dice. He loves, he loves dice. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's very much akin to Disco Elysium. I can't remember if I mentioned Disco Elysium last we spoke, but that's very much worth picking up. Uh, yeah, I don't think you did, but you mentioned it to me personally, and I did pick it up on uh, on on Switch, and I had an absolute blast playing that game. Yeah. But I did not play it in the past year. I think it was that was twenty twenty one. But yeah. I, I would also highly recommend that. Yeah, there's a, a director's cut of that, I think, which uh, or it might be called the final cut, something like that. Some sort of uh, Blade Runner-esque naming convention for, for the, the final <laughs> title of it. But uh, that comes with like a fully voiced version, which I think adds a lot because that's brilliantly done. But yes, yes highly recommend that in, in that same vein. Um, Sleeper Citizen, it is a... Uh, science fiction sort of cyberpunky type story where you are... You wake up on a, a space station of sorts. You have no memory of how you got there. Um, your body's failing. You're under threat from numerous forces, and you're just trying to muddle through, uh, trying to work out who you are, what you're doing, earn enough money to sort of survive the day to day, keep your body alive as well, and everything's undertaken with uh, kind of dice rolling mechanics so you will have the odds in your favor but that isn't a guaranteed success at any time every day you wake up with a different dice pool and you have to work out where best to spend them um and the game then kind of sort of has two two parts uh, where it, big social interactions or physical interactions require higher roles but if you're doing something that's more tech based more sleeper based um, more more science fictiony then that tends to involve the lower scores so it doesn't matter what you've been rolled in a given day there's always something to do but how you choose to spend it will sort of shape out how your days go by uh, so, which they call cycles what's interesting about the cycles is that there are certain uh, things that you want to hit within certain times so you might have four days before a bounty hunter comes and finds you so you've got four days to kind of get your shit together otherwise you could be in trouble or you know your body might fail in the next five or something or there are mercenaries after you or the job that you want to complete the ship that you want to get aboard is going to leave Um, there's a real sense of urgency to it and you do have to spend your time wisely otherwise you will be stuck there Uh, and the objective is of course to escape you don't want to be stuck on this on this ship um, which can happen though so it it also makes for great replayability as well because you you never really know how different storylines are going to shake out shake down and help help you out or set you back um, until you play through so no sincerely recommend Dave you would particularly like this I think if you like these kind of chance based encounters Yes, I am just looking through the screen grabs uh, of it now. Uh, this is 
absolutely up my alley. Uh, thank you, Tom. I'm enjoying this episode just to listen to your recommendations because I'm going to come on. <laughs> I'm going right away. This is on Switch as well. I'm going to download this. The artwork in this game uh, is beautiful as well. It's sort of a anime sort of style to it all, right? Yeah, and it's, it's fascinating to play something where you don't have like a little avatar protagonist that you wander around. You're really just sort of looking at places that you could go on this ship as if looking at um, a map menu in many other games and choosing, oh, I'm going to speak to the guy at the mushroom restaurant. We're going to see what he's got to say. And then you walk through the, the kind of um, dialogue options there. But it's not as if you, as I say, you don't exactly have an avatar that's moving around, but you still have a really tight concept of the space, where you are, who you're engaging with, the little districts and areas and the types of people that you're likely to find there. It feels like a space whilst not actually having to show you that. It's much more like reading a book in a way, a kind of choose your own adventure type book than it is um, necessarily a, a, a game. But with the dice space mechanics, it could only be achieved in that format. It's a really interesting way to play. Um, and I'll be interested to see if more developers take on board something like this which is all narrative first and then kind of gameplay second it's all it seems sounds like a bit like a solo tabletop role-playing game in many uh, ways yeah yeah i yeah. think that's a really good analogy yeah i reckon it is is exactly like that which is even more up my alley okay <laughs> um and where did you play it um tom on the xbox as well it's on the xbox game pass just smashing Man. through the xbox game Pass. are we gonna get are we gonna get five for five on your, uh, <laughs> Sad, on your sadly list. sadly not but for one very good reason <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, okay well um so that's citizen sleeper yeah uh, yes on xbox yes, game indeed. pass and look looks like it's everywhere else um my number three of the year is a game from a few years ago it's a vr game i played it on ps vr i don't think i talked about this in 2020 but i might have um it's called walking the uh, it's called walking dead saints and sinners um now this is the sort of thing i um probably saw and uh you know while scrolling through the playstation store and would have definitely just walked on right past it because it looks like shovelware right it just looks like another shitty uh licensed tie-in and also particularly with vr games i think the quality the average quality level of vr games tends to be a bit low and there's a lot of terrible licensed um throwaway stuff in there so i ignored this but then it, it did feature in a lot of uh, uh, people's um best vr games on the psvr at least um and i gotta say it's very very good um it, it is well everyone knows what the walking dead is so it's just zombies right but the um and and again that's another reason i was a bit put off by it because that's a franchise which is a lot like its title it is shambling <laughs> it's really just <laughs> shuffling on way past its expiry date um but i think what what is so good about this game is um the vr controls are excellent um and i was i was doing it with the playstation's move um controls uh, so i think i think it does require the um the two whatever they call the move sticks as well because you control the the hands of the character but it is immensely satisfying to, uh, and this sounds a bit sadistic, but uh, but it is immensely satisfying to have a zombie come towards you in a, in in virtual reality, and and you can grab its head with one hand, you know, as they do in the in the show and in the comic books or whatever, you know, grab its head to hold its teeth at bay while you like frantically like try and get a screwdriver or or a bottle, and then you you with your other hand you ram it into its its skull and like and that is basically the reason it's on my list because that is that's an incredibly satisfying act to repeat over and over again um but also the if it was just that over and over again i'd be happy but the game itself has quite a good um narrative which is um i think welcomingly separate from the um rick what's his name's comic book series and the tv show it's separate from uh, from all that stuff um, so it's an original story in um, I think it's New Orleans um, and it is also has some really good survivalist mechanics which I'm a big fan of I'm a big fan of uh, games where you've got you know you've got two bullets and you've got um, some nails and you've got a packet of cigarettes um, and that's and that's it the last and of us got... you're describing the last of us yeah I mean <laughs> I love the last of us um so it, it is, yeah, it's very like the the Last of Us in that in that regard. You've got next to nothing. There's a lot of crafting, 
options um and upgrade stuff um and it's a lot of fun it's really really good i spent i spent a lot of time uh in that game i would recommend it so that's walking dead uh saints and sinners that would be on i think it's on any vr thing so really impressed by all the, the vr stuff that i keep seeing um certainly the you know it's going to be really interesting to see when the playstation vr 2 comes out um and i believe pretty much all manufacturers of vr stuff at the moment have a have a, a next gen vr uh, headset in the works i think to your point about getting even closer to like absolute immersion to be you know it's one thing to play a slasher and be able to do ex- what you've described what horrible things you've described to a zombie a once living person <laughs> um in in a game is one thing but it's another to to experience it at that level i am if anyone hasn't had a chance to have a go at vr there's all kind of vr experiences that are out there at the moment i'm sure if you went into a game does game still exist any shop that sells physical stuff remember sure. shops to shops still exist <laughs> um it's worth trying a vr headset just to see how fascinating that level of immersion is because i think the big takeaway that i have from the first time that i used it because i thought it was going to be a bit of a fad but Obviously, because you've got different screens over each eye, it feels three-dimensional. It's the 3D illusion that you have within that space. So you do feel like you're within a place. It's quite hard to ex- explain. It's kind of slightly uncanny. Um, and for things like horror, yeah. it's truly awesome because like, it, you, you are there. You are experiencing it in a way that feels claustrophobic and inescapable. I think it it is the genre for me that, uh, works best in, in that VR setting. It's one of my favorite genres. And uh, the, the Resident Evil um, uh, Quarantine, it was called, or, you know, Resident Evil 7, um, that's on VR as well. And that is just incredible uh, in VR. It's terrifying. Um, so, so yeah, if you're, if you, if you, if you're into um, horror, survival horror, um, and you have a way to to get access to that in vr i, I cannot recommend it enough uh so tom where are we up to what's your uh number two game of the year right we're on to the number two and i think this has landed here just because i found it immensely enjoyable um it's a marvel game it's the guardians of the galaxy the guardians of the galaxy video game that's my number two as well what a coincidence what are what, what are the chances um, <laughs> It's uh, It has been just an absolute riot to play an action game that feels kind of big enough. It's not it's, it's not open world. It is kind of on the rails, but never feels like that. Um, but with a good number of hours of gameplay in there, that makes a whole th- all of the levels feeling really distinct and it feeling very enjoyable start to finish. Um, I've It's been a long time since I've played a, an action game of that ilk where it, it, you get that feeling of just genuine joy doing every little part of that as you do and the progression system is brilliantly measured um it's mm. a lovable ensemble cast and despite it being a different casting to the guardians of the galaxy film the characters still feel familiar with the exception of star lord who's a they've taken a slightly different direction it all feels it all feels like that world that we know from the from the film franchise um gameplay is really tight there's just no complaints here I, it's it's just an absolute riot to play yeah, I, I was surprised. Uh, this is another one where which um, I saw this come out uh, and I kind of rolled my eyes again and I thought, oh yeah, here we go. Um, but then I remembered that Spider-Man um, game came out. Now, this is by different developers, but uh, you know, I remembered that, yeah, oh, hang on, these things can actually be good. And then it got a uh, great review. So yeah, I picked it up for cheap only a couple of months ago. And yeah, I was so um, surprised at how good this was. The the cast the casting is excellent and the writing is really really strong you spend a lot of time with the you you just play a star lord i think we should say um but you spend a lot of time naturally with the other members of the guardians of the galaxy and there there's hours upon hours of dialogue um recorded between this cast the voice acting is excellent and you could just be walking from one place to another and they're having um sort of inane conversations or banter but it feels very uh authentic to those characters and it's funny and naturalistic um and the action as you say is is um really fun it's a fun game to play the um you sort of control the other characters through uh various team actions and and directions all, all of that is sort of upgradable and customizable, as you said. I think that that in particular was really tight. Um, there's been so many games where you play as a squad 
where you lead as one main character but have to play the rest of your squad. Um, think of things like the most recent Dragon Age game, which came out a million moons ago, or um, maybe even the Final Fantasy games where you know you have the character that you lead but you're also trying to control that squad it always feels janky and forced and really annoying and there's yeah. only two games that i think have ever done it particularly well and that was this and a game that this is very reminiscent of but the mass effect franchise um yeah which a lot of the things in this the fact that you have a ship the fact that you can wander around and talk to crew members the fact that that crew is then an ensemble cast that joins you on these excursions um it's a really smart move to make a game with this franchise in that style um, i'm genuinely impressed yeah i agree and it's almost unfortunate that you mentioned mass effect because it is high, it doesn't quite um it doesn't it live pale, up to mass it effect. pales next to mass effect it's a yeah, different which is game just yeah. incredible but you're right there are uh, there are similarities i do let you do get to walk around um your ship there's a lot of lovely little touches to this game as well like you can um uh, you can access a huge back catalogue of um, uh, 80s and 70s bangers, just like Starlord would have on your ship. Um, you know, there's a whole huddle mode where it'll, uh, when you're up against it, you kind of, everyone, you inspire someone through a speech um, and then uh, Starlord puts on his his uh, Walkman and, and then another classic banger comes on, which is always fun. Um I think the, the, the where it lets itself down is maybe in some of the sort of it tries to tag in sort of choice mechanics, which I think are largely kind of pointless. And I, you know, I Google what, what happens if you pick the other choice and it turns out the same thing that's going to happen anyway. You know, it's just the, the illusion of choice. Whereas I think Mass Effect uh, employed choices that really mattered and then, you know, uh, kept that going through on a whole trilogy. Like I loved in Mass yeah. Effect how your choices would would echo into the second and third games it's unfair to compare anything to mass effect because that's probably the yeah. perfect franchise so don't forget everything i said don't go into this thinking it's mass effect well, ex- but do go into it thinking like if it reminds you of something it's probably mass effect yeah it's it it is it is a good enough game in its own right to uh to warrant warrant to go um okay so that's both of our uh number two so let's that brings us to uh Tom, your number one game of the year. Hit us. It's God of War. It's God of War 2. It was always going to be God of War 2. How could it not be God of War 2? It's <laughs> of God of War 2. Yeah. It's the biggest yeah, game yeah. of the year, really, isn't it? Yeah. Of it's God of War 2. It's not Elden Ring. It's God of War 2. <laughs> Have you played Elden Ring? I haven't. I, they're not for me. I'm, I'll be willing. No. The first person to put my hands up and say that those games, the Souls-like games, are just not for me. Punishingly hard. I've, I, 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 life's too short. Come on, man. <laughs> There are other games out there. If you're going to fill uh, 150 hours or something, then do do something that's not that, please. I haven't played uh, any of them, to be honest. Um, but, it's because uh, they're punishingly yeah. hard. Yeah, a little bit. I'm a little bit put off by it. And I know it, it's contradictory to what we were saying earlier about games being a bit too handholdy, but I'm kind of comfortable somewhere in the middle. Like, I tend to just set games to the hard setting, and that's good yeah, enough Yeah, like, me. if you want, yeah, yeah. you want to do that, yeah. just, like, you just jump <laughs> the hard... T- and I do yeah. think there's a lot to be said for that. I think, like, when I think about games when... I was at school, for example, there would have been moments where the, the playground moments where people would say, have you played this? Have you got to this mission? Because it's impossible. And one person would be like, oh, yeah, I know how to do this. And you would invite them around to come and complete that bit for your yeah. of, of your Like that used to be a whole thing that happened. because You, you pass them the controller yeah, yes. just to get past that one bit. They would nip yeah. by for, for 20 minutes or however long and <laughs> just complete those. But, but games parts. used to be punishing. They were they, yeah. games were next to impossible. Did you ever play the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game on the uh, the NES? I, I think not, and I think because it was punishingly difficult. That that ruined me. That underwater <laughs> level. I mean, it's it's famous, but uh, yeah, I actually I was uh, I was five years old when I was playing that, and I, I asked my mom to have a go because uh, I just couldn't. Wow. <laughs> I was just like, can you try this? <laughs> I'll give this to yeah. an adult. <laughs> That'll be able to do this. <laughs> Didn't go well. Yeah, no, similarly, I remember, I think it was San Andreas, uh, GTA San Andreas, and there was something involving, uh, it was either little helicopters or a little plane, and for some reason, this kind of stupid mini game that was a main campaign mission um, was oh, so I remember fantastically that. difficult compared to everything yeah. else. Because yeah. you had to land, and you had to take off and land it as well, right? That was it, yeah, yeah. It was between yeah, yeah. that and the kind of tower defense type one where you had hundreds oh. of helicopters flying. That was a whole thing. Anyway, I miss moments in games that were like that where you would have yeah. like a relatively normal game, just some really hard moments. But the idea of a whole game consisting of that, I just, it's not for me. It's not, not for, for you. Me. 
Well, tell, tell us about me. God of War uh, Ragnarok. God of then. War 2. Yeah, no, I think it was always deserving of a sequel. I think the first game uh, had set up that there was going to be a sequel. There's so much more story to tell with those characters. And now, uh, of course, you um, have uh, Atreus with you. And Atreus is, is a little bit older now, a little bit older and wiser. I think there's some really fascinating stuff in the previous game that I'd forgotten about until I watched a recap where he was a real problem when he was uh, just a child who found out that he was godlike. And he was just the worst for a bit. And there's a bit of maturity that you see in him now. But there's still some kind of teenage rebellion that's there. So he's a really fascinating point in his life. Um, it, the writing is, is razor sharp on it. Everything there feels feels really natural. The pacing on it feels great. And it is, it's a weird game in that it's the it is quite on the on the rails with the areas that you explore and you just have to forgive a bit of that i think there's a couple of moments where uh, you'll come up against you the god of war will come up against a small wooden fence and not be able to hack through it it's like i feel like maybe i might i might be able to do that but so yeah you have to forgive a little bit of the level design in that respect because the puzzles and things throughout all of it really engaging uh the combat so tight um mm. considering it's kind of slight quite quite slashery but it's still it's still having to play tactically with it as well and all of that everything that was great about the first one remains in here and it's not one of those a classic maneuver in any sequel of a game it's like oh you were really powerful in the first one and now for some reason your powers have been stripped away and you have to build your way back up again <laughs> you're still as powerful in, at the start of this as you were at the end of um the previous game it's just um, that the enemies are more powerful. Is that, yeah, is that it's, it's just yeah. It, it eases you back into because it's been some years now since the since the previous one. I think that was 2018, maybe. Um, it it does what well, it eases you back in without overwhelming you to start with, but also reminding you of the kind of power that you had from the previous game, um, and then fills in like a whole bunch of new mechanics without o- it becoming overwhelming. It's very easy to be like, oh hey, all of that stuff that you had to remember from the previous one. How is bunch of new stuff you've got to know uh it's just smart builds and embellishments on that which make it which make it really good and again it's one of these pseudo open world areas where it's like there are areas to explore but all of them are interesting and it's not vast swathes of um of empty kind of wasteland with with nothing in them i'm looking at any game that ubisoft seems to be making at the moment so we'll make it as big as possible and there's nothing in it um it it's not that at all the worlds are much smaller and much tighter Yes, in in particular, mm. uh, the most recent editions. Uh, but this this doesn't have that problem at all. It's like, despite being a, smaller and a little more limiting, like if you see a mountain in the distance, you won't necessarily be able to go there unless it's on the specific path that the game takes you on. But every step of the way, there are going to be things to do, things to see, things to interact with, destroy, punch. There's a lot of punching. It's the god of war. It's not the god of the god of making polite conversation, unless it's a wooden door. In which case, with the exception you, of maybe four or five impenetrable that. wooden doors, I look forward to the lore of those doors being expanding <laughs> and why they're uh, why they're enchanted for whatever reason. But no, absolutely, absolute masterpiece. Um, they also do some really interesting gameplay things. I think that allow you to deviate from what you expect of uh, of the God of War game, but without feeling at odds. And I won't say too much more than that because if you if I go into too much detail, it, it'll explain. Uh, the biggest differences about it. I know you mean you can read into it if you want, but there are a few moments in there that mix up the format quite well. Um, okay. That feel like a really nice addition. Nice. I haven't uh, played it. I don't have a PS5, but I will get one eventually. Um, but I loved the uh, the first game. I th- just what I liked about you know you described about the combat there. What I loved about the combat in God of War is that it felt like heavy. It felt like it had weight. You know what I mean? Like yeah. like his hits his hits with um what's his uh his he's got a hammer doesn't he um, so there's the the axe in this oh the axe it plays yes. very much like thor's hammer in that you can recall it you can throw it and um, that's right it's and, it, and it's and it's got like ice moves and so oh my god that feeling yeah when that when that uh, axe comes back to your hand and the controller kind of shakes it just like 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 it, it, it you feel the sort of brute force of uh kratos um, and I thought the writing and uh, voice acting in that first game uh, was excellent, and I'd imagine it's uh, it's much the same in the sequel. Yeah, the the boast of the writing staff on this um, this edition as well. Uh, Anthony Birch, who is um, he did the Borderlands series, is actually involved in this as well, and his writing certainly in terms of like dialogue 
um, is always is always razor sharp, and uh, yeah, you you really you can see the amount of love that's gone into this as a sequel. It's not just a cash in; it's a, it's a real labour of love. Nice, okay, uh, nice and Tom. So that's um, uh, God of War Ragnarok on uh, only on PS Five. Uh, I sounded a bit like the ad there. Uh, right, so my my number one game of the year is embarrassing. It is a mobile game. Uh, it is Marvel Snap um and oh this boy. is yeah i know right uh so I, I i um did say earlier that i'm a big into card games collectible card games um you know i uh, played a lot of hearthstone uh, a few years ago so much so that it kind of took over my life and i had to delete the the, the app wow um I am probably in a similar position with this game where I've only been playing it for a few months, but it is uh, consuming my every uh, every waking moment. I think this is the problem with a mobile game is that um, I'm playing it on the train. I'm playing it, um, you know, when I'm waiting at the pharmacy, I'm playing it, um, you know, when I'm having my coffee in the morning and I put the boys in front of uh, uh, the TV. <laughs> I'm playing, you know, it's, it's, all the, it, it's just catching, hoovering up all my incidental uh, time so it, it uh, and it is engineered to be um addictive almost in a predatory way uh, <laughs> a lot of these games and 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 i think it is a couple of the developers um who made hearthstone uh so they they know that they know how to do this they know how to do they've it got effectively. you they've got you yeah. good they've got me and it's got all the marvel licensed characters so they've they, uh, characters so they've uh, you know they've they've got me doubly but um i will say the game is fiendishly simple um but like has such depth to it in the variety of the um the characters that you collect who all eat, eat the cards each have their own individual um sort of abilities or powers that relate directly to the character from the from the marvel comics um so it's it's very authentic and true to um to marvel characters um it is so easy and simple to learn uh it's effectively um there are three lanes on your mobile screen it's made for mobile i mean it's on um steam as well but it's 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 works so well on mobile it's just like three lanes uh you play there are six rounds you each play a card in each of those rounds so there if the game's over in like five minutes um and whoever has the most power in in two of the lanes wins the game and it is that it is really that simple as a game and you're playing i should say you're playing against other people um but it has such depth to it in in the strategy because as i said each of the characters have different abilities but each of those three lanes are a marvel themed location that affect um the outcome of what's played there so x card gets more power or you know um it doesn't sound very exciting, but it is. It uh, sounds. It sounds weirdly reminiscent of Gwent. Um, from oh, the I loved Gwent. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I spent more time playing Gwent in Witcher than I than I did being so his, being if, Geralt. If you've <laughs> not played The Witcher Three, which I think there is a a new revamped version that's coming out. I think there's like a next gen update. And if you're thinking about picking oh, it up, wow. a great way to play it is don't touch Gwent, the little side game, for the entire (laughs) campaign. Play the campaign, and then play as uh, Geralt retiring and entering the Gwent Leagues, like a (laughs) Pokemon-esque, making his way to the top. I spent so much time in the Gwent Leagues, or just playing Gwent with anybody I saw. Hey, want to play Gwent? (laughs) Yes! Yes, I want to play Gwent with you, random stranger in a pub. That's why the game takes, like, 100 hours to complete. There's probably 20 hours of story (laughs) and then a good, good chunk of Gwent. Um, Gwent is so good, they released it as its own game. And I also got that and and played that for a a whole long time. And they also then did that Witcher spin-off card game, um, which I've forgotten the the name of. But that's on on Switch as well, um, which is has similar mechanics to Gwent but uh not 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 quite the same. Um but yeah, if yeah, if if you liked Gwent, then you're going to like Marvel Snap. I'll say that. <laughs> it's very similar. Yeah. Amazing. I have to check it out. I remember at the time when it was released, I think they had uh, a bunch of early invites and people were clambering over each other to get an early invite to uh to Marvel to Marvel Snap. 
uh, yeah, well, it's out there now and it will uh, destroy your life. So I don't know if this is really a <laughs> 10 out of 10 game of the year. Let's go. <laughs> it's, actually, it's actually a cry for help. I need somebody to tell me how to stop. <laughs> um, well, come to right, the Tom, wrong place. That's our, yeah, I know. You're, not, you're no help. Um, so that's our, that's our top five. Uh, let's do some honorable mentions. Tom, I've got none. So what have you, <laughs> what else have you, what else have you been playing? That's well, all as I've it's played. sort of been a couple of years, I thought there's, it's probably worth shouting out some stuff that actually came out maybe last year or that had slipped through um, in the last couple of years because it's easily done. Basically, anything that I've picked up on Game Pass that's, <laughs> that I should have played a few years ago but didn't. Really can't stress enough how good Game Pass is. I'm genuinely impressed by it as an offering. How much did Gates pay you? <laughs> <laughs> what? Nothing? No what? Who have you been talking to? <laughs> um well, I guess actually one of the big one of the big draws of it is that you can play it without a console. If you have a PlayStation controller, for example, and you you just plug that into your laptop, stream all of the games you want. You don't need to fork out on air an Xbox to play it, which means that you can also play it anywhere, which is really helpful. There's a mobile version and things like the the Backbone or other um, controllers that you can get for phones mean it's just suddenly become a, a really viable and really playable. Um, uh, platform but without you know the necessity to dump 500 pounds on some hardware as seems to be the case with everything else which do you think that xbox is leading the way in this space because i know google just scrapped their arcadia no what was it called stadia 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 yeah 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 yeah. they're very much picking up where they left off and i think everything that's been successful about that they've um jumped on or bought up uh so yeah though though it's not gone well for stadia i think for these pre-existing things like for for well, hopefully sony at some point um but definitely microsoft this has been working out for them it seems to be going quite well uh, and i think it's a matter of time before they start play- pushing for consoleless play because um, like we mentioned very briefly earlier, the infrastructure is kind of there at the moment. Uh, you can mm-hmm. you can quite successfully play a game with very very little latency. And certainly, turn based games and things like that they really come into their own there. But I've been playing things like Halo Infinite, um, even first person shooters. Though online Twitch gaming, maybe not so much, but it's it is pretty good for most other things. So worth a shot. It's worth a punt. Get one of those free trials. See if uh, see if it works for you. I think that's probably the starting point. So I use the discount code uh, Thompson. <laughs> yeah, use it, yeah. at checkout. Yeah, yeah. You, use <laughs> my use my links. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so a few games that sort of came out from that, um, all of the ones that I've, I've mentioned in the top five. Also, Tunic. Tunic was really good. That was a, it's a Zelda-like game um, oh. where yeah, yeah, it's and it tells you absolutely nothing. In fact, it makes a big point of telling you absolutely nothing. You really have to kind of muddle through and work out what all of the different items do where you've got to go how you get to different places um which i think is just such a such a fine art to be able to put you in a world with absolutely nothing at all and then it's up to you to try and work it out but the immense sense of satisfaction when you finally do work out what you've got to do or where to go or how to put all of the pieces together um is is incredible for a game that has absolutely no dialogue in it no sort of character work or anything. You just have... It's just... No character work, just vibes. Vibes only. And you have to make your way through the game. <laughs> which is big into. Tunic. Tunic. Yeah, worth a, worth a right. shot. I think it's... Um, I'm writing that on my list right now. It's worth seeking out. I can't remember what other platforms it's on, but uh, it is on the Xbox. So there's that. Tur- well, it turns out if you just Google Tunic and nothing else, uh, like I do, then you... you in, uh, in Google Images, then you just get a lot of fashion. <laughs> Who knew? Who knew? A lot, of, a lot of nice looking tunics available. <laughs> uh, a few other things I think worth shouting out. Um, we mentioned Mass Effect briefly earlier, but the Mass Effect Legendary Edition came out last year. It was the free game on the uh, PlayStation a few months ago. I don't know if it's on the Xbox Game Pass. It might be. Uh, if it is, definitely worth a play. Such a good trilogy. They've done a lot to kind of remaster the first game that was perhaps the most dated of the lot. And it still is. But as someone who joined the franchise at the second game, only knowing very little about the first, it all still you know holds up wherever you decide to jump in on. And did they fix you know, that? Um, did they fix that sh- that dodgy vehicle? The Mako, yeah, yeah, the, the Mako, yeah, yeah, yeah. They've re- retained enough jank to make it reminiscent of, <laughs> uh, of those initial playthroughs. But it's uh, it's it's a much more streamlined experience now. I think they've they've softened a lot of the edges. 
Uh, that game was quite rough when you go back to it, and they've done they've done well to make it less rough, but it still it still feels dated. So if you want to start that franchise in the second game with a quick recap of what happened in the first, then I'd probably do that if I were you. Otherwise, you might be like, "What is this recommendation? Get the hell out of here!" <laughs> Um, a few other games on this list. Tiny Tina's Wonderlands. I still think the Borderlands franchise is doing absolute wonders for co-op play. There's so few games now that are, are really co-op geared in, in that kind of way. And the, all of the stuff that they learned from the third Borderlands game with regards to like how to scale enemies based on your level but retaining your progress. It means that you can play with anyone at any time without worrying about how far any of you are in the storyline which is so good because it's so difficult to get people together these days to sit down and actually play stuff um so to be able to have that is great if you've got a larger group of you then you know you're not worrying about like oh that person's so much further back i need to you know go through all those levels again with them it's all scaled so anyone can play at any level with anyone which is ideal and i think more games should take a should take a leaf out of that book nice two more things i think i've got here um death loop which I think came out start of start of last year, was it? I really struggle to remember. It might have been the year before, in fact. Um, but that I've heard of was this. supposed uh, to be excellent. Yeah, I think it was. It was from the people who did Dishonored, um, and it was just a really nice way to kind of mix up that format. It's not a fantastically long game, so you can just sort of smash through it. It's um, it does suffer a little from kind of any sort of time loopy games where it, it, uh, t- it's not a roguelike, but it turns into a roguelike because you have to kind of go through. But a really interesting way of telling a story where you have to get all of the pieces in the right order as a day progresses, making sure that the right targets are in the right places to assassinate them at the right times and stuff, making sure that two people are in the same place. It's it's a fascinating kind of chess movie, dice movie um, thing to try and get that in order. It, it falls down a little in that there's kind of only one way to solve the problem. It would have been perhaps nicer if they or you know gave the player a little more agency if it turned out that we're actually four or five ways to complete this quandary of how to assassinate all the people and finish the time loop but sadly not um and then one other game i think is worth a shout out was Sp- spider-man miles morales uh amazing sort of ah, follow-up to the spider-man game absolutely absolutely sterling work from them. and i'd argue that that is perhaps better than the spider-man game in that it was smaller <laughs> which meant that to be able to 100 percent and platinum that game was no chore whatsoever uh you it, it all still felt like a big worthy world full of interesting things but it wasn't so sprawling that it was overwhelming not that the previous one was but this you know if you found that in any way overwhelming then this uh the sequel is really good and the sequel to both of them is then coming out uh either this year or next i think from uh, insomniac games very excited for that i am very much looking forward to catching up uh, with Miles Morales whenever I do get time to buy a PS5 and play one day game. one day because uh, that first game was brilliant I really enjoyed all the stuff online about the that that poor actor being completely replaced in the uh, the remaster version that the, the Peter Parker actor yes right yeah as as is the trend with motion capture um is to to get an actor in and capture their likeness and then put them directly into the game which, uh, you know, is an interesting way of doing things. But it does also mean that you can just be replaced. Um, so they updated <laughs> yeah. all of the uh, all of the graphics so that they looked a tiny bit more like Tom Holland um, after the, the Spider-Man so Spider- Spider- films came out. Because that's what I liked about that game and the, and the Guardians of the Galaxy game. I liked that they kind of made their own version of these characters. It didn't just feel like a movie tie-in. Um, you know, yeah. Blonde Star-Lord. What a, what, a, what a mad world that is. It would be interesting, I think, if they, given the multiverse stuff that Marvel are doing at the moment, as to whether this is considered an arm of that. Oh. I'm sure there's, there's probably more than enough articles online about people who've looked into and written up on this. So you can read that in your own time, but I'll be curious to see if they do that. I'm almost sick of multiverses now. I think everything, <laughs> too has, everything big. has a multiverse. There's too many verses. Yeah. Too many. Um Okay, I'm going to I'm going to close out with um a few uh games I want to mention, but they're not video games. They're tabletop role-playing games cuz uh, in I know. They're still <laughs> games, right? Still counts. Sure. Um so got uh got big into these um uh in during the the pandemic. Um I think like a lot of people sort of um tried out uh, Dungeons and Dragons, got into uh, a critical role. Uh, and then I, uh, I, uh, I roped 
uh, Tom here into a, a few games and with a, a few other people. So we've uh, we've been trying out quite a lot of things over the past couple of years. There's a few I'd like to um, to mention. I guess for anyone who doesn't know what a, what a tabletop role playing game is, it is it's, it, if you play if you played a video game RPG, it's basically uh, uh, that, but instead of looking at a uh, a video game screen and a world that someone's made the world exists in your imagination and you Whoa, slow i down. know right in my and, mind or, that's right but what's so good about it is it's in a collective imagination so whatever you, you you do play them with a group for the most part and uh you are all describing and contributing to a shared story and narrative that could unfold in any way as you go and i think that's what to me what makes it exciting and almost more exciting than a video game is that like the uh you know this, that there is really no end to to an you know the biggest open world video game has an end it still has you know yeah. there there are the mountains in the breath of the wild that you can't go past there's the the wooden door that kratos cannot smash down but uh there are literally no limits to uh no to limits your to your imagination? imagination jesus all right yep <laughs> but it is it is it is <laughs> true i think what's fascinating is not only is that true but also budget like in any video game <laughs> yes. or any film, there's, you know, you want that explosion that's going to cost money. Someone's going to have to sit and program or actually blow that up. Whereas uh, in your mind, it costs nothing. So, you know, yeah. the, the size you and just, scale is, is unlimited. You just say the biggest explosion you've ever seen in your imagination just happened. <laughs> and then you all imagine five different explosions. And it um, doesn't need to be directed by Michael Bay. <laughs> no, although uh, we we have uh, asked Michael Bay to direct a few of our projects, um, I will say um, that so Dungeons and Dragons is probably the most uh, uh, famous one. So I'll just spotlight a few other systems that uh, that we've played, and most of these are sort of uh, relatively accessible. I would think if you just pick up a book and 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 uh, want to read them or want to learn them. Um, I played um, uh, a licensed version of. Uh, avatar the last airbender not the way of water uh, a, a game called avatar legends was released uh, on kickstarter uh, last year uh, and i've played it um online a few times you can actually do um they do a curated games uh the the publishers magpie games where you can just join anyone online and there's a a, a dm uh, there and they'll take you through a short uh, game i've played that a few times if you like the avatar um and Korra universes like i do this is a really fun um game that really captures the spirits of that of that show you know you play you have to play it uh like a, an adolescent or a teenager um who is sort of grappling with their their own powers and i think it's just a lot of fun they, um to to, <laughs> to naturally to pick uh to pick an element and then and then wield it and i think what that what this game does really well is that you know i took when i played i, I played as a, uh, as a as a as a waterbender in the in the Korra era and uh it doesn't put a lot of mechanics around how you use the bending powers you just kind of describe what you want to do um so i could literally like uh, you say i'm gonna I, i'd like to pick up that puddle over there and splash it in his face and then you kind of roll to see whether or not it happens uh, and and it, uh, there's sort of modifiers to that so it's a really like rules light kind of system it's really excellent um another game i really enjoyed was uh iron sworn star forged uh by a guy called sean tompkin this uh is is um you can play by yourself or in a group and i've been playing it um by myself because that's just how much of a loser i am guys um, and that's also why i haven't played too many video games because i play some iron sworn star forge uh by myself and this is a um it is a sci-fi rpg bit like mass it's it's like mass effect basically it's like mass effect but in your imagination you you create a character you roll on a random set of tables to see sort of what encounters uh, or planets that you're going to encounter it's like randomly generated um planets and scenarios and it's a it's a lot of fun uh, another game that um uh, tom and i have been uh, playing in a session is delta green and uh, that is a um a sort of a, it's, a, it's kind of the x-files Right, Tom is probably yeah, the best way I think to describe that's, that's it. That's a fair description. Supernaturally, kind of uh, Cthulhu adjacent, but not not completely Cthulhu. -y. I think isn't it isn't it based on the Cthulhu system, or have I made that up? Yeah, that's right. So there's a um, there's a, a a famous TTRPG called Call of uh, Cthulhu, which is um, based on H.P. Lovecraft's um, novels, 
and yeah it's uh, it's it's i think the the mechanics in this game are fun because you play um you play agents investigating a supernatural event but one of your sort of stats is your sanity and that's uh, uh you're not able to get that back <laughs> once it's gone much like real life um except through therapy which you can do in between <laughs> in between sessions uh if you are playing a long time but it's a really fun and sort of interesting um uh game uh, another one um which i've enjoyed i've got th- uh, three more we played the it last year is a uh, death in space by um free league games um and this what i enjoyed about this game is that a lot of a lot of these games uh require the the dm uh or the the game the person running the game to sort of have a lot of a nar- have a have a narrative relatively pre-constructed um to sort of guide your players through uh but death in space a bit like iron sworn has a lot of random tables you can you can roll on so this is something that you you can just kind of read the book it's very digestible uh and then um tom and a few other people i just threw them into this and we just started rolling uh rolling dice on tables and uh you, you kind of don't know where you're going to end up um yeah space cannibals if you've got the, the answer the right space cannibals is the, is always the answer when is it not yeah. when will it stop being <laughs> space cannibals um <laughs> it is if you get the right bunch of people with something like this i think you can and I think this is something I've come to really value in certain RPGs is, is that uh, certainly the tabletop RPGs is that you you can be quite light on the rules, but if you've got the right people, then that doesn't matter. Like the stories are going to be bonkers and, and bombastic, and you can uh, you can really sort of it, it's almost it's almost as if you need to give each of the characters enough rope to hang themselves, and that seems to happen in all of these uh, all of these ones that we've played, and it's never it's never not hilarious. So I'm into it, and that's. And that that's why these kind of things are fun because um, you de- you never quite know where someone's going to take it or going to take their character. And I think watching the impulsive decisions of your characters ruin your best laid plans as a game master <laughs> is uh, is is really part of the uh, the appeal and the enjoyment. Um, two other things we played. One is um, and these are both movie licensed games. So if you did make it this far into this episode and you are a, a part of our regular listeners this is a movie podcast uh, i'm gonna t- i'm gonna bring it on back home uh there's a star wars um rpg um called edge of the empire well there's kind of a series of them the edge of the empire one is set in the outer rim in the star wars universe and you play as uh, sort of han solo types rogues and criminals and rapscallions and uh, uh, Tom ran a game for us last year, which was uh, a heap of fun. I think this system is really good because it taps into that the chaos of um, of Star Wars. And if you fail uh, a role, so if you attempt to do something and you fail, there's still an opportunity for it to turn into an advantage somehow for your character. So th- 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 I think that's quite a, a, an example would being... Um, you attempt to uh, shoot that stormtrooper um, as it, as they're coming towards you. Uh, you've rolled the dice. Oh, you failed. You've missed, but you rolled an advantage. So, oh, you've actually shot the door behind him, which has closed a blast door in front of his face. For instance, that's probably the least exciting. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's failing, that. failing in the good way, succeeding in the bad way, which feels very, very Star Wars, and it takes a lot of the kind of number crunchy stuff out of it which is probably some of its downfall. I think a lot of these tabletop games involve some element of combat, which is much more akin. It's like the XCOM games where you have to be strategic and tactical and know your abilities, and, and it's, it is a bit more number crunchy. Um, and then some of them are a lot more uh, just, just vibes, just how do you feel, <laughs> what do you want to try and do, <laughs> which, um, which it, dep- it depends what group that you're playing with as to how, how, um, how number crunchy you want to take it. And I think this system does fall a, down a little when it comes to combats and numbers and health bars and and all of that stuff but there are other ways of streamlining it streamlining it so it's um it's a lot more just kind of story and feeling and i think that that kind of story driven stuff where you really are sort of making it up as you go along is where this is at its strongest i think so too but i think i think as you said it's down to the um to the people playing and what they're after i think some people really do just want to uh, gather gather around a table and um move miniatures and and sort of get into the nitty-gritty of armor and combat and i did this and you did that and i do i do quite kind of find that appealing but i think yeah for the most part i think these games shine when you're just 
sharing a narrative and having a bit of fun and don't get bogged down in mechanics yeah. i would say and i think of the like mechanics the, the sessions sorry you go dave no sorry i was just gonna say the mechanics can often be off-putting for new players as well because you know you've got these massive rule books of things that need to be learned um and and i think that's often a barrier to entry oh god yeah these impenetrable tomes of hundreds of hundreds of pages which uh loosely tell you yeah. what you already know it's like what, what do you want to do you have to roll for it there will be consequences that's the crux of pretty much all of these but i was going to say i think of the sessions of this that we done the ones that were their best or certainly the funniest were the ones where you were doing nothing at all i think there was one where you all went shopping for a whole session for for like two hours <laughs> yeah. we role played you going shopping and it was hysterical yeah uh yeah yeah and, and and i think that's yeah as you said like where the game where these games shine is in the unexpected um and it and kind of in in the mundane sometimes right you can you can because you you know poor you you were running that game and you had a whole <laughs> a whole world and a, and a and a plot and all these places you wanted us to go and we were just like no i know we're gonna go to the bar now it's a really good exercise, I, I think, in storytelling where you start to appreciate how good um, game game manufacturers or, you know, the writers tend to be to give you justified reasons to go to places uh, because it very <laughs> seldom feels forced. But if you're trying to corral a bunch of six people to go and do something that they don't want to do, then um, it <laughs> does feel a little at odds of what you're trying to achieve. And sometimes you just have to make something up on the fly. Oh, yeah. Uh, That's how most of the characters there. were introduced in that. Yeah. A lot of fun. Exactly. And then the, the the last thing I'll uh, I'll recommend is another movie licensed tie in, and this is the Alien um, role playing game, which uh, uh, Tom and I and a few others played last year. This is by Free League, um, and they've just released a Blade Runner uh, one, which I've uh, I've purchased as well, which looks a lot of fun. And I think what they did really well is if you like um, the Alien series, like I do, they um, they really got into the core of what that series is all about um it's firstly your all your characters are s- disposable right a bit like the, the permadeath of of xcom like we, we um we played with a group of what there was uh six of us right and uh there was one person made it through um so just like the alien series you are all going to die you're all going to die <laughs> horrific deaths um the odds are against you but that's kind of half the fun of it is the the uh the <laughs> the gory and ridiculous deaths um that that occur and the other thing is the um um with two other things one is they they introduced uh stress mechanics so this is something you know the you know the, the characters in the movies are running down a, a corridor they're being chased they're they're, they're gonna mess up they're gonna are they're, they're gonna they're gun's going to jam or they're going to slip on something um and that makes it harder to to achieve something uh, so that the stress keeps mounting which makes your likelihood of failure um even higher and then the last thing i think which made this game particularly enjoyable is uh, and i think they nailed this the real bad guy in all the alien games is always the humans right um it's ash uh, spoiler for 1979's alien it's a uh, <laughs> You know, it's Ash is the bad guy in the first one. Um, Paul Reiser's character in the second one. It's it's human greed is always yeah. uh, is is always the villain, and this game is really clever. And they give you an introductory uh, narrative sort of starter pack, which I took and I sort of uh, played around with and and modified for my own purposes. Um, but it's 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 really strong out of the box. You, if you get pick up the Alien starter set. Uh, they give you all these predefined characters, but what's really clever is they all they give you motivations for each of these characters, and these motivations are to be kept secret um, by the by the players um, throughout the course of the game. So what you end up with, and I and I gave this to Tom and all the other players. So what you end up is with is um, players who are often working against each other, or working for their own self interest, um, or actively sabotaging uh, the mission. Or the crew, and also, you know, you have to make one of them a secret android uh, as well. Right? Naturally, it'd be rude yeah. not to. Yeah. Um, so I think that that makes it a lot of fun from a, a player's point of view um, because you're um, kind of second guessing uh, your characters, uh, your your fellow players, the whole time, and and what their real motivations are. And I even made one of them. Um, his mission was to investigate the other characters and find the traitor. 
Uh, so he he became a little Sherlock Holmes detective as he went. Um, and that's that's it for me. I don't know if you have any others you wanted to. Yeah, I think it's probably mention. worth a shout out to um, a similar system, which was Tales Tales from the Loop, um, which mm. is uh, almost exactly the same kind of mechanics of that. But the story is kind of set in a Stranger Thing esque suburb where there's been mysterious going ons, and you as uh, kids have to go and solve those mysteries. And then from that, thematically similar, there's uh, a couple of systems: kids on bikes or kids on brooms. Um, one of them is again suburban science fiction. The other is uh, much more kind of Harry Potter esque um, schools of witchcraft and wizardry and the likes. And uh, yeah, like a really really fun, really really tight system where a different dice will be based uh, against a different stat. So if you wanted to be really good at something, you would have a 20-sided dice against it. And if you wanted to be bad at something, you'd have like a a four-sided dice against it. But doubles mean things. And it's because of the the different dice pool that puts it together. It means that it's always quite exciting. It's always quite fast-paced. I think it's a really good good means of... um, a good entry level for uh for people looking into moving into rpgs and stuff who aren't necessarily looking for the number crunchy stuff and just want to get rolling uh a really good starting point nice one um right look forward to playing those in 2023 um okay the, this is the end unless else you want to want you want to mention tom any other business no no i think uh i think that's it for now other than the general apology for not having played more this year <laughs> yeah yeah likewise uh maybe it's a new year's resolution for for both of us to have games that feels attainable that feels like a that forget going five to the games. gym let's play more games yeah, yeah i can do that <laughs> yeah 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 let's find five games that came out in 2023 <laughs> that we can play to talk about at the end of this year well paul wallace i hope you enjoyed uh listening to this um, we hope you're happy else... with yourself paul you asked for this <laughs> thanks paul no, uh, thanks, if paul. anyone else uh, listened or would like to uh, chat to us say hello uh, let us know um, if you want us to do this again next year uh, we are the cinemile at gmail.com to send us an email or at the cinemile on uh, all the usuals we've got a patreon page where you can support the show um, and get access to all our uh, retro movie and tv reviews just like paul wallace does uh, that's at patreon.com forward slash the Cinemile. And uh, Tom, do you want to promote yours or the other Tom Silcox um, work or where they can contact you? Yeah, if you Google Tom Silcox, you'll find someone. Um, but yes, I'm on <laughs> the Twitter, on the Instagram, on most of the things, I'm sure you'll find me if you're interested. And uh, of course, if you're interested in any of the tabletop RPG stuff, which I know a lot of people think is this big impenetrable um, you know, barrier to entry, where do I even begin? By all means, hit us up, ask us questions. We'll be more than happy to talk through it. Yes, that's true. I I think it's such a it's a, such a fun hobby. I'm really glad um, that um, I got into it the last uh, couple of years. I'm really enjoying it. I think if anyone has played an RPG video game and you enjoy those, you're halfway there. It's all stats and upgrades and it's all that kind of stuff. If you enjoy that stuff, then the rest is just you know you don't need and and, the, and those big rule books. You don't need to read all those. You just need to find someone who knows how to play it. Exactly that. Agree. Yeah. Right, Tom, this was fun. Uh, thanks for thanks for joining. I'll see you next year. A pleasure, as always. See you next time. <laughs> Bye, everyone. When you are at your weakest. In fear and doubt are a burden too heavy to bear. Remember this. You are not, not alone. alone. ACAST powers the world's best podcasts. Here's a show that we recommend. What would you say if I told you there's a book that can teach you how to win The Bachelor? What would you say if I told you producers caught multiple finalists reading that book in this season that's currently airing? What would you say if I told you the producers don't want anyone to know that their show has been compromised? How do we know all this? We wrote that book. I'm Lizzie Pace. And I'm Chad Colchin. We're the authors of How to Win the Bachelor and the hosts of the Game of Roses podcast, a bi-weekly podcast where we break down all the biggest plays, errors, and MVPs in the game of reality television. Listen to Game of Roses wherever you get your podcasts and go to howtowinthebachelor.com to get our book. Acast helps creators launch, grow, and monetize their podcasts everywhere. Acast.com. <laughs>